Never Say Never Again actually goes back to the 1950s when Ian Fleming, in collaboration with producer Kevin McClory and screenwriter Jack Whittingham, created an A-bomb hijacking story called Latitude 78 West. When that didn't sell, Fleming wrote a novel called Thunderball and didn't credit either Whittingham or McClory, creating a huge lawsuit which resulted in Fleming losing the rights to Thunderball and Kevin McClory got the rights back and made a deal with Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman which created the Thunderball movie. My late husband, Jack Schwartzman, who was originally a entertainment attorney and it became known that the rights were now available to remake Thunderball. And as an attorney, he felt that this was a totally legally doable project. He thought it would be a fantastic coup to go outside the studio system and do a Bond picture. So it really came down to Jack's wanting to establish himself as an independent producer of major projects for the marketplace. My dad's biggest passion was if somebody said this can't be done, then he wanted to do it. Even if it was crazy, I mean, embarking on remaking a James Bond movie where some arcane legal loophole in the rights is something you go, why would you even want to do this? Find another movie if you want to make a movie with Sean Connery. What Jack did was convince Sean that this could be done, that Sean would have so much of his input in the shaping what would be his last time playing James Bond. Oh, yes. 007. Connery's involvement actually came when Jack went to him and said, these are the rights, this is what I believe I can do, and this is what I'll pay you. And in those days, he paid him a huge fee compared to what actors could get at a studio. And it was actually Connery's wife who came up with the title of the picture because Sean had made the comment that he would never do another Bond picture. And when he agreed to do it at dinner one night, they were trying to think of a name for the picture, and Sean's wife said, never say never again. It's a remake of Thunderball, and so it must be discernibly Thunderball. We had to do the book, and we could not copy anything from the film. Lorenzo Semple is a fine dramatist, and I had seen wonderful work of his, and I read some stuff that he had done. I wrote a treatment, the idea being to bring back an older Sean, an older Bond. That appealed to me a great deal. I stuck with the vision of this other Bond. This is a later Bond. He's called back into service. The idea was that the opening of the movie, he would be sort of in a rehab, not from drugs or anything like that, but just that he'd been burned out. I took the treatment over to Spain, to Marbella, where Sean was living. Spent a couple of days with him, talking about things, and he read the treatment, and uh, Sean said he'd do it. I knew we were taking a gamble, because the Bond fans, I felt, were probably a younger crowd. And they wanted to see Bond shooting, screwing, doing all those things that the Bond is supposed to do. I felt that it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work with him. The script did nothing like the recent Bond movies. We had nothing like that uh, super violent, almost comic strip opening that they always put on them now. In matters of death, Spectre is strictly impartial. The bad guy is not someone who's got silver teeth or fangs or one eye or is disfigured or is a monster, no. The bad guy is a contemporary businessman, corrupt because he loves power. What's your latest venture? Oil. Yeah, as to the overall threat in the movie, we had been through the oil crisis in the 70s, and so obviously setting an atom bomb that would destroy the uh, oil fields would be an extremely powerful and timely extortion thing. You should have studied the plot more carefully. The script was not as action-packed. Nobody expressed at this moment much concern about it. Because the idea from the beginning had been to have this not a super action movie, it's sort of a psychological study of an older spy, a spy who came in from the cold kind of thing. 
Was it a Bond story? Was he really an older Bond? Did it have the humor of a Bond? Kirsch and I work on the script a bit. And I mean, there's no conflict of any kind to speak of. We sit down and uh, I am told with nobody's objection, do some rewrites, take this sequence out, take that sequence out to save money. Some of the action sequences. I read it and I felt that it wasn't the older Bond. It was something different. It sort of was Bond in some places and not Bond in others. He was having problems with it. There was no doubt about it. I am nervous about Sean, because this was done without discussion with Sean. Sean read it, and he told me that this wasn't his idea of what the film would be. He basically hits the fan. He says, this is not the movie I agreed to do. Sean missed the action. There's a period there when they were afraid that he might back out of it entirely. So immediately something had to be done to make him happy. And so there always has to be human sacrifice. That's the only way to keep things going. I told Jack, I said, it, it doesn't work. The impression was given that all these ideas, these changes were my horrible ideas. And that, you know, if I were removed, well, then everything would be okay. They could fix them. It just didn't come together. And I don't think Jack liked it either. When Jack said they decided to go and take another route or whatever phrase the producer always used when they fire a writer, I was not terribly upset. After Sean objected, I may have worked for a couple of weeks with Kirsch making some changes. Once Lorenzo Semple Jr., the screenwriter, left the project, Irvin Kirshner had to assess how much material would remain in the project and how much has to be changed. There were two distinct problems, the story, the dialogue. What was the tone of the dialogue? What was the story? By now, we had four scripts, and we put it together, and it began to make sense. It began to have a form. And that paved the way for the introduction of the new writers, Dick Clement and Ian LaFrenet. They were great on dialogue. They could get the little humor, the little bits of humor, and get away from the exposition. Mr. Bond, I need a urine sample. If you could fill this beaker for me. From here? We were kind of in that lovely position that writers are in when it's not your mess and you haven't, you know, all. All they can hope is that you, you may be able to help them out of it, but you didn't create the mess. I thought they were terrific, but they should have been brought in in the beginning. And they were unfortunately brought in at the end. We started to write, but we soon became aware that there were various factions on the set and a great deal of tension on the set. You're not going to make any trouble, are you, Mr. Martin? Because of the threat of litigation, they had been told at some point, you can only use the original dialogue from the book. It's impossible to write a screenplay where you only use dialogue from the book. It's, a, it's insane. Everything had to be checked by, by the producer, by the director, by Sean, and then by the insurance company who were insuring the company against litigation. So they were checking through everything we wrote as well. So there were four sets of people checking every line that we wrote, which was extraordinary. Sean was more concerned with the tone, with his dialogue, which had to be, you know, a bit of polish, a bit of wit about it. And Sean would come in and read the things. And finally, he began to say, yes, it's coming together. I can feel it now. It's, it's happening. It's happening. I think Sean was relieved because he knew our work for English TV. I think he felt reassured to have British voices writing for him. No, caught you seducing his wife, did he? No, sir, not at all. But in fact, I lost four pounds and God knows how many free radicals. The first 40 pages of the film are pretty much ours, with the exception of one or two of the action sequences, which includes all the Hell Farm stuff, the Bahama stuff with Rowan Atkinson's character. A great deal of that is, is, um, is down to us. Obviously, things like the shark sequence, no. When we suggested a different opening, they were delighted, and also it was one they could shoot in the Bahamas while they were there. I saw an abandoned house and I thought of an opening in the abandoned house, which is the present opening. So while people were shooting sharks and underwater stuff, it was, it was relatively easy to write that sequence. And it was kind of fun, and uh, it cost almost nothing. When the film was about eight weeks into shooting in the Bahamas, 
The crew were kind of not madly happy, and to bolster their morale, they showed them about 35 to 40 minutes of cut footage, including the opening sequence, which at the time was fantastic. It was just Bond, you know, racing through, and you think it's a real action adventure, and then you discover it's a training exercise. But it was all done to a ticking stopwatch, and uh, it really worked. Later, in I think one of the worst decisions in post production history, they put a song over it. Never, never say so counterproductive to what we'd gone for, which was, as Dick said, an action sequence with a ticking clock. We do this, and then over is a, is a love song, never say never again. And we, we thought that was absurd. Of course, it, obviously, it's still there. Heading North Africa, Palmyra. Palmyra? Where is that? We had to shoot in five countries. Now, to keep track of all that is very difficult. And Jack was not a really working producer. This had not been his first movie. He would have done a better job in terms of corralling the script and the director. But this was the first one where suddenly if the trucks didn't show up, everybody was turning to him, as opposed to him being the guy on the phone screaming at somebody else saying, why didn't the truck show up? And I can't blame him because he was in the courts all the time in London. There was a big lawsuit going on between the other company that was doing their bond. And uh, so Jack Schwartzman was most of the time in court. So there was no one in charge but the line producer, which was a big job for a line producer because he had to make decisions that no line producer should make. Money was very short. I mean, for the budget, it was going to be a, a battle all the way. This was a difficult way to start a picture, especially a film that had great expectations with the audience and that was going to cost a lot of money. He said to me, you know, at the time, looking back on the experience, he really needed to have more help, more seasoned, tougher help in making certain producerial decisions as the movie was going on. The film depended on a climax underwater. The book did also. I knew that I had to do the underwater stuff. This was a problem. How do I not do the Thunderball film and yet make the film? And that it'll be a proper climax for what came before. And underwater, while it sounds attractive, is really a terrible medium for an action picture because everything is in slow motion. You can't move fast underwater. All they do is they go up and sort of grapple with each other and cut each other's air hoses and stuff. It's very boring. I don't think the ending is one of the best endings of a, of a Bond film. I think the ending is a letdown. I think it becomes very mechanical at the end. And I don't think anybody had really paid the ending much attention. I think people's there have been so many problems that I think people get tired. I mean, this is, this is what happens very often with scripts, that endings do not get the same amount of attention as beginnings do. And I think this was true in this case. We finished shooting in Spain, and I went back to London, where we were cutting the picture. I spent quite a long time in the editing room with Kirsch, who, who'd got to that stage where I don't know where I am with this, and, and we quite useful in cutting a lot of stuff out. My, a lot of it was underwater action stuff. We had some pickup shots in the cave. I was bored with shooting this kind of thing, men crawling along, shooting machine guns and all that. Never had a moment of pleasure after that. I was tired of the way the picture had to be made in pieces with different writers, with holes in the script that had to be filled on the set. If I had a chance, I'd love to reshoot the picture and get the script right and do it properly. You know, when you make a film, it's always a combination of angst and fun, especially when you're on location in Europe. The angst being that you have budget, you have scripts, you have schedules, you have bankers, you have insurance companies, you have lawyers, and you have them on the one side. On the other side, you are on fantastic locations and really making magic and uh, that's what we did. I don't fault the actors in the picture. I fault what I had to work with. 
It was a great experience. Uh, I know that Jack loved it. And the more he got into it, the more it was obvious to him that he was going to be able to pull it off. And the more he knew he was able to pull it off, the happier he was. At that point, there had never been an independent film produced that had made that amount of money when you combine the Warner Brothers and you combine the overseas success of the picture. The only good memory was Sean. If he hadn't have been the Bond, I don't think the picture would have been finished. He is the one that made it pull through just by his good nature and his steadfast control of his character of Bond. He was Bond and he made the thing happen. And I give him credit for the picture being finished.